How do we provide electricity to 1.3 billion people? That's what our organization thinks about every day. And you, the people sitting in this room and listening out there, can actually play a very important role in the solution. And I'll tell you why and how that is later on. But first, I want to talk about energy. Why is energy even an important issue? Why is it a woman's issue? And what does it mean for the 1.3 billion people that don't have access to it on a daily basis? In fact, energy is the foundation of everything in our modern society. Imagine we woke up in Brisbane tomorrow and there was no electricity. Well, one of the first things we probably notice is that the computer doesn't work and the light doesn't work and our TV doesn't turn on. And this could be because of a natural disaster, such as Hurricane Sandy, that took out power from millions of New York City residents in late October. But pretty soon after we are enjoying this peace and quiet of having no TV, no lights, and um, no computers, <laughs> we realize that many of us cannot actually do our work. If you work with computers, if you get customers through the internet, if you use email on a daily basis, you cannot actually work. And without work, we don't have income, and without income, we don't have money. So luckily, we've all been really good savers, and we have a little bit of money in the bank. But when we try to access it in the bank, we realize that becomes difficult without electricity as well. There's no ATM machines, the credit card machines don't work, the bank teller is probably having a hard time actually telling us how much money we have with the bank without access to their financial systems. But luckily, we dig down deep in our purse and we find a fistful of gold coins and one of the first things we think about buying is food. But fresh food has become a problem as well because without electricity, there is no refrigeration. And without refrigeration, food spoils in a matter of day. Fresh meat, fresh dairy, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, all of these things. And not only does our refrigerator not work, our grocery store's refrigerator doesn't work, and all the way up and down the supply chain. Hygiene also becomes an issue. There's no dishwashers, there's no washing machines. The showers don't work so well without a water pump, which requires electricity. So without fresh food and with poor hygiene, some of us might start to get sick. But hopefully we don't get too sick because our healthcare system is also based on electricity. The diagnostic equipment, um, MRI machines, CAT scans, x-rays, all of these things require electricity, life support systems. So as important as electricity is to us in our daily lives, we can no longer say that it's merely a convenience. But 1.3 billion people in the world today still live without adequate access to electricity. This is a huge number. If we take the entire population of the United States, it is more than four times that population. And if we take the largest passenger airplane there is out there today, the A380, it is 1.5 million of these planes. And it is nearly one in every five people living on the planet today. But this isn't a problem that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of the people that we know have access to electricity. So where do these people live? The easiest ways to see this problem is to look at a map of the Earth at night. And we overlay where we know people actually live. And we'll realize that over 95% of these 1.3 billion people actually live in one of two areas. The first is Sub-Saharan Africa, and the second is South Asia. For people that live in these areas, not only do they deal with all the issues of accessing modern health care, fresh food, and even work that we talked about earlier, but the traditional fuels that they use to replace electricity, such as kerosene for lighting and wood and other types of biomass for cooking and heating, also come with a lot of problems and dangers of their own. Let's start off with kerosene. We've all seen the Western movies in which there's a lantern in a barn and the horse kicks it over and then the entire barn lights on fire. Unfortunately, that is not too far from the truth. Tests have shown that kerosene fires can take down an entire corrugated house in a matter of eight minutes. And countless people die every year due to burns um, and other injuries, and kids sometimes drink it and poison themselves as well. But people continue to use it because it's cheap, it's available, and they have no comparable option. Let's move on to 
uh, wood which is used for cooking and heating. The smoke and soot that comes from these fires has been known to cause long-term respiratory illnesses, cancers, and premature deaths. In fact, over two million people die every year from hazardous methods of heating, lighting, and cooking. Most of these are women and children in developing countries. This is, in fact, more premature deaths each year than malaria, than tuberculosis, or HIV. So while a lack of electricity affects everyone, it actually is a woman's issue. It affects women more than most. And this is for two reasons. One is exposure to the health risks that I talked about earlier. Women are literally the ones that are home more often. So if there is a fire, they're going to be the ones that are caught in the fire. And they're the ones that are going to suffer from the long-term respiratory effects as well. And the second is a matter of time. Without electricity, women have to spend several hours nearly every day collecting fuel. And this is time they can't spend on education. This is time they can't spend on earning an income. And this is time they can't spend on empowering themselves in other ways. And we hear all these statistics, but we don't really know what it feels like to live without electricity. So I wanted to share an excerpt from an email um, that a physician friend of mine working in rural Liberia wrote. I remember working in rural Liberia. The hospital had power in the operating rooms, but not always in the rest of the hospital. At night, the power was usually on, but only for limited hours. One patient was ill, and we knew she was likely to pass away soon. Breathing fast, blood pressure low, clammy and cold. We wanted to get her oxygen, but the oxygen machine requires electricity, and it wasn't on. We had to send someone to find the man who had the ability to turn on the electricity for the hospital. In the end, we never got the chance to use the oxygen machine. She passed away with me standing on a bed, squeezing a bag of IV fluids to get into her veins to keep her blood pressure up. It was very frustrating that I couldn't do much more for her. Both lack of electricity and lack of diagnostic equipment were equally problematic. That made me, makes me teary every time I read it. Um, but let's summarize what we know so far. We know that electricity is absolutely vital for living a healthy, productive life. And we know that 1.3 billion people in the world still do not have adequate access. And we know that this is a problem that affects women. So what can we do about it? What can we sitting here in this room actually do about it? Well, I'm going to propose an idea to you, and I want you to think about it carefully. What if there was a way for us to help families purchase a cleaner, safer energy, and at the same time earn a return on investment? Is that even possible? Well, there's been two trends in recent years that actually help us make this a reality. The first is an increasingly cheaper way of producing electricity. That's just a fancy way of saying we have the technology now to produce electricity rather cheaply. And the second is success of microfinance as an industry. So let's start with the first, the technology. We know when we think of producing energy these days, we think of oil, gas, and coal. But for two main reasons, these type of technologies don't work for the rural communities that we're talking about. One, they're really expensive. To build a coal plant requires a billion dollars or more. And two, it takes a long time. It takes three to five years to build that coal plant. On the other hand, we have renewable and sustainable energies, which are not only better for the environment, but they are also more scalable. So things like wind, um, hydro, solar, and geothermal. And out of these four options, solar especially is pretty interesting because it is the most portable and the most scalable. A five watt solar panel, which is about this size, can literally change a family's life. They can replace the kerosene that they're using for lighting with the LED light, and it can provide charge for a mobile phone as well. In addition, lucky for us, the price of solar panels have been dropping over the last five years. In the last three years alone, they've dropped by about 50%. And all this means for us is that it makes it more affordable for our end customers, who are some of the world's poorest of the poor. Unfortunately, we need to get these panels from the factories to the customer, and there's a lot of costs inv involved in that, things like shipping, uh, duties, taxes, installation, and maintenance. So the total cost of the product by the time it gets to the customer is still too expensive for some of the world's poorest of the poor. And we're trying to reach everyone here. So we need a form of financing. This is where microfinance comes in. And microfinance is just the idea that I or anyone else here can lend an entrepreneur in a developing country a small amount of money, say $25, and that entrepreneur pays me back over time. 
Kiva is probably one of the more famous examples here, and it's facilitated over $350 million in loans since 2005 at a 1% default rate. This 1% number is an extremely important number to remember because people often have this perception that investing in developing countries is a riskier pr proposition. But you compare that 1% default rate with the 2 to 3% that's typical of mortgage default rates in developed countries, or even the 5 to 7% um, default rates in some of the areas around Brisbane, and you realize that microfinance is becoming a viable and interesting option for loans. So what happens when you combine these two ideas together? One, there's a cheaper and cheaper way of producing electricity, and secondly, there's a way of financing it so even some of the world's poorest of the poor can own this technology. It's this, this cycle that involves you. So it's the idea that all of us can loan a family the money they need to purchase either solar panels or solar lamps, and that family can pay us back over time using the money that they're currently using for kerosene or other types of fuels. So at the end of the day, what I end up with as an investor is a chance to earn a, re a little bit of money, a little bit of return on my investment, as well as to contribute to a social and environmental cause. And what the family ends up with once they've paid off the loan, is the solar lamps or the solar panels that they can continue to use to produce cleaner, safer electricity for their families. So this is exactly what we're currently piloting in Ghana. It's very exciting. We're literally putting in the first installations in the next few weeks. And customers are so excited because finally they can afford this technology that they know is important for the long-term well-being of their family. Creating access to Energy is one of the most important problems of our time, and it's a problem that definitely affects women. But on the bright side, it is also a problem that we can solve. We have the ability in our own hands to provide a solution to this problem. And it's definitely a problem that we can solve by working together. Thank you.